Thanks to, to the organizers for, for having me. I mean, of course, I've been uh, following some time uh, from up close, sometimes from far away, this series since the beginning. So it's very nice to be to be here finally. Uh, I will uh, tell you in advance that today I feel a little bit under the weather, so I hope I don't doze off during, during the talk. If that happens, uh, feel free to wake me up. And um, then we just uh, start. Uh, so I am a postdoc here in Paris under the supervision of Manuel Thierry and Laurent Blanchouin. And uh, so I will start uh, with introducing the people that actually did a lot of the work uh, that I'm going to show you. I'm going to talk to you about a system that was developed by a PhD student in the lab, Clotilde, and then many of the experiments were performed by Baganat. And on the theory side, uh, Sudip and Jean-François Joigny uh, did uh, also a lot of the work. And I also have to acknowledge Jeremy, who purified the proteins that we use for the experiments. Alexandre helped us a bit during uh, some ablation experiments that you see, and the whole group, uh, which is a great group. And if uh, I mean, you should uh, get in touch if you're interested in this kind of things. So let's start with uh, Statistical Mechanics 101 particles in a box. We have two kinds of particle, uh, magenta and cyan, hot and cold, whatever you want. And of course, uh, they're not interacting. They're, let's say, an ideal gas and nothing happens. They just uh, move around in the box and occupy all of the available space. But now we were going to do a bit of a mental experiment and introduce inside this box an entity, which I'm going to call a Maxwell demon. Uh, and I mean, I call it a Maxwell demon more to lure people in attending the talk. You see, it's not exactly how it works, but it shares some of the similarities, some, some similarities with the original one. So it's an entity that it's able to tell whether a particle is um, cyan or magenta, and it will push all the magenta particles on the right and all the cyan particle on the left. There's a magic tail that is able to do that. And as it starts, doing its job, you see that the particles start separating in space. Uh, the magenta particle, of course, accumulate on the right, and the cyan particles accumulate on the left. And uh, this goes on until the, the active pumping done by this demon uh, compensates the fusion that will try to, to bring the particle to, to an isotropic uh, state. Um, and this is not really how the original Maxwell demon worked. But it does share uh, with it what I think it's an important insight that Maxwell had, which is that if you can read the microscopic state of the particles and you can act on them depending on their state, whether they're cyan or magenta, hot or cold, and whatever, you can do crazy things with it, things that would not happen at equilibrium and, of course, at the expense of having to uh, spend energy in order to do that. Um, if we make a bit of a leap, cells, biological cells, they, they share a similar problem in the sense that they need to bring things where they need them. And so they need to come up, they needed to come up with a with a mechanism to to segregate things in space. And uh, what they did was developing uh, several things, but amongst them, cytoskeletal transport is one of the main things. And what you see here is a cell and the yellow filaments that you see are microtubules. It's the microtubule network of the cell, which is not a simple network of spaghetti inside the cell. These are actually very dynamic filaments. And importantly, they're polar. I mean, they have a tail and a tip. And they're radially organized inside the cell. And there's another set of proteins. You all know this, but uh, just in case called molecular motors that are able to uh, walk directionally on these filaments, either from tail to tip or from tip to tail. So because the network is radially organized and because you have these motors that are able to walk on them, uh, this sort of configuration is a bit like a Maxwell demon in the sense that I told you before, where a filament is able to bring some motors towards its tip and other motors towards its tail. So if you start in your cell with, let's say, nutrients, uh, everywhere, and then you couple these nutrients or whatever they are to molecular motors, uh, 
because the network is polar and radially organized, over time, the motors will bring things at the periphery or at the center, depending on when, when they're needed. So in a way, it's a different way to segregate things uh, into space. Um, however, one question that you might have is how did this polar architecture form in the first place? And one of the hypotheses, maybe not specifically for this problem, but, but in general in, in the field, is that uh, the, the cytoskeletal components of the cells are a self-organized system in the sense that you can take everything that's inside a cell and um, homogenize it, mix it together, and then put it under the cover slip, and it will, just by the interactions between all of these uh, components, reform um, a polarized network. And what you're seeing here is exactly these experiments in which, in which Feng and Ferrell showed that if you take the cytoplasm of frog eggs and you mix it to, you, you take it out of the cell, you mix it together, and then you put it back in the cover slip, this, this bag of protein self-organizes into compartments. And what you're seeing in green are the microtubules, which organize in a polar way. And I mean, they do the, they do this without any blueprint. They do this as a self-organized system. Uh, but what you're seeing here, I would say it's still very complex in the sense that there's a lot going on when you do this kind of experiment. There are chemical networks, there are waves of mitosis going around. So this is still an extremely, extremely complicated uh, system if you want to study self-organization. And what we do is something even simpler, which is what we call in vitro reconstitution. And I think you already had a lot of speakers uh, working on, on related problems in which instead of taking a cell and, and starting from the cell, we start from the components. We purify the proteins in the lab and we mix them together in uh, controlled amounts. And we try to see whether we can reconstitute with a very minimal number of ingredients what we want. And specifically, we focus on filaments, microtubules or acting filaments, and molecular motors, uh, kinesin, myosin, and, and what have you. And the idea is that we can try to find the minimal number of ingredients so that mixing filaments and motors together gives rise to a polarized architecture with, with cytoskeletal transport in it. Um, I, just as a, as a um, philosophical point about this, there are two ways you can go about, about it. One is you mix this system, you ignore completely that this is a biological thing, you treat it as a physics problem, as a self-organizing system where you learn general rules, and they are cool because they are general rules so they, so they describe everything, but they're also useless because they're so general uh, that, I mean, maybe you don't learn as much. Or you can go the other way, the opposite way, which is really focus on the biological problem that you're interested in, mix the things in the same proportion and in the same way that they are, that you think they are working uh, inside a cell and really try to answer a precise biological question, which is uh, how does the cell constru construct a polar architecture for real? And what I hope uh, to show you today is that these are not actually two, two opposite views. You can sort of ping pong between the two where you st start with a biological question, you understand its fundamental physical rules, and then you can go back to the biology and see whether what you found out as a physical principle, it's, uh, it's true. Um, although, to be honest, uh, the, the general principle we're going to discuss today maybe there are interesting, interesting uh, on their own. And just to finish the introduction here is a bit of, of a slide where we showcase the kind of things you can do with this system. What you're seeing here is how filaments self-organize as an active matter system inside um, inside vesicles, just to, to, to change their topology. So you can study transport of filaments in cell-like mimics. You can start contract, contraction of networks. In this case, it's the actomycin network. You can study things that start to have at least look a bit like a cell where they have a minimal cytoskeleton and they can deform and you can study the self-organization of the microtubule network in different conditions and all of these systems share the fact that uh, you start with minimal components and then you know exactly what's in your system and you can learn general rule about it uh, out of all of this today 
we're going to focus on the problem I described you before, whether we can reconstitute a polarized architecture with cytoskeleton transport starting from filaments and molds. The system that uh, I worked on for most of my life so far is the gliding essay. Um, it's an old system that was that started as to as a way to characterize biochemically molecular motors, and it works a bit like this. You take your cover slip, you stick molecular motors on the cover slip, you put filaments on top, and now the motors will try to work on the filaments, but because they are stuck, what actually ends they end up doing is pushing the filament, and you end up with filaments uh, moving in 2D on your cover slip. And from this, you can learn how fast the motors are moving or how, how, what's the persistent length of uh, filaments that, that glide and things like this. But roughly 10 years ago, uh, some, some work started appearing which showed that if, if you take this system and you raise the filaments density a lot, you end up with collective phases of filaments moving together. So that the small interaction between filaments gliding on the surface gives rise to uh, pattern, collective patterns of filament. And this was the first step uh, in, in the idea that you can use this system to understand how the cytoskeleton self-organizes inside a cell. Uh, in this particular case, they started showing that, uh, that filaments can form pneumatic and polar structures. But if we go back to our original problem of creating a polarized architecture and cytoskeleton transport, we, we, we have two main issues with this system. The first one is that the motors are fixed in space. So if you want to understand how they segregate in space, sticking them on a slide is not the best idea. And the second issue is that the network is self-organizing, but then it's moving too much. It's just going everywhere. The first problem is easy to fix. Uh, instead of sticking the motor on a solid substrate, you stick them on a fluid one. In particular, in this case, it's a supported lipid bilayer. It works exactly the same, except now the motors are on a diffusive substrate so they can both walk and push the filament. The result looks exactly the same, but what you don't see in these movies is that under these filaments, the motors are actually moving and they move in the direction opposite to the one they're pushing, but because they are on a pretty viscous substrate, they can still exert a force. So you end up with both motion of the motors and motion of the filament. And again, if you play the trick of raising the density, you end up with collective faces. They look a bit different than before. Uh, and we don't we won't go very deep inside into this problem today. The, just the idea is that you can get again collective faces of filaments, but now the motors aren't moving anymore. Uh, but you still have the second problem, which is that the network is going everywhere. So what we thought about doing was maybe to stabilize the network, what we need is putting two different kinds of motor, one that moves in one direction and another one which moves in the opposite direction in the hope that the force balance on the filament will still lead to something interesting, but sort of keep the network where it is. Uh, in particular, we used uh, for the experiments, I'm going to show you a two kinesin, one which goes towards the plus end, the tip of the filament and one that called NCD that goes towards the minus end, the tail of the filament but this is completely irrelevant. It's a magenta and a cyan motor and they go in different direction. That's all you need to know. And the system that we're going to use looks a bit like this. We have a membrane. We have these two kinds of motors on the membrane and the motors, I hope you can see my mouse, will diffuse on the membrane. Every now and then they will eat a microtubule. When they eat the microtubule, they will move. They will reach the tip and they will unbind and diffuse until they meet the microtubule again and so on. And there's two kinds of motor, one that goes from left to right and one that goes from, from right to left. Um, we were not the first ones that had the idea of mixing two different kinds of motors, but um, originally people was, were doing this on glass, mostly in the lab of Stefan Dietz in Dresden. And the idea is that you have the two different motors stuck on a glass slide, you put your microtubule on top, and of course, if you put sort of the same quantity of the two motors, the microtubule doesn't move. Uh, if you start offsetting the density at some point, the majority motor will win and the filament will move either 
uh, only right or only left, of course, right and left relative to their polarity. Um, so exactly what you would expect in the sense that the dominant motor transports the filament and that's it. And now we do the same thing on a membrane. And at the first glance, you will say uh, it's exactly the same. We put only one motor, the filaments move. We put only the other motor, the filaments move. Uh, you can see the two motors have slightly different speed. Again, that will be relevant. And if we put both of them, the motor, uh, the filament doesn't move. It's in a tug of war state where nothing happens. However, the main difference between what what you what I was telling you before is that now we are on a membrane. So under this filament, which is kept in place by the motors, the motors themselves are walking on it. And if we go and look at where the motors are under the filament, because now they are able to move, you see that. Uh, the plus n directed motors accumulate at the plus tip and the minus n directed motors accumulate at the minus tip. Um, and they do this in a, they're in a dynamic state in which they, they stick, they walk, and then they detach, and then they restick and so on. But on average, the two motors exert the same force on the filament, so the filament doesn't move uh, and the, the, they segregate in space at the two tips. So if you're being very optimistic about it, you could say that, again, we have to do with something that looks a bit like the, the initial Maxwell demon in the sense that this microtubule is sorting the two kinds of motor uh, at the two opposite ends. There is, however, an important difference that will play a role later on, which is that if there is, by some fluctuation, a bit more of either of the motor, the microtubule will react because the motors exert a force on it uh, meaning that if the cyan motor wins, the microtubule will move a bit, and if the magenta motors win, the microtubule will move a bit in the opposite direction, and this is why you see this transient motion of the filament, which is due to fluctuation in the number of motors. Um, and now we play exactly the same trick that we did before, in which we start uh, raising the filament's density to see what happens at the collective level. And things start becoming interesting already if we increase the density a little bit. So these are filaments in exactly the same conditions as before, where the, you would expect a tug of war. And instead, you see that the filaments are doing something. And what is going on is that there is this sorting of the motors at the two uh, tips of the microtubule. And if you have two microtubules which are um, oriented uh, one one against the other, what happens is that this one will push magenta motors at the center. Also, this one will push magenta motors at the center. The magenta motors pushed by this one will exert a force on the other filament, and the magenta motors pushed in by this other one will exert an opposing force. So basically, you're creating an accumulation of magenta motors in the center, which results in a force of balance on the two filaments, which are pushed away from each other. And this is what you see in these cases where two filaments seem to slide one against each other because each either one of them is accumulating one kind of motor in the center uh, that pushes the other one away. And the other one pushes motors in the center that push the first one away. And you can also have the opposite situation in which the filaments have the same orientation. And now this one will accumulate magenta motors that push the other one left but the other one will accumulate cyan motors in the center that will push the uh, first one right. So what you end up is an attractive, effective, attractive interaction between, um, between the filaments. In other words, the fact that each, each microtubule is sorting motors at its, two, at, it, at its two sides, it's locally creating a motor imbalance that can be felt by neighboring filaments resulting in this effective interaction in which uh, parallel microtubules tend to align and anti-parallel microtubules tend to uh, go away from each other. And then we raise the density again. And if we have a lot of filaments, but one of the motor is dominating, in this case, I think NCD, uh, you get the collective state that I told you at the beginning when you only have one, one motor. If the other motor is winning, you go to the opposite side, you get again a collective state uh, due to the one of the two motors winning. 
And if you are exactly in the middle where you would expect a tug of war condition, meaning that nothing should move because on average, each filament should have exactly the same amount of motor. Instead, you end up with, with this. You end up with the filament separating in states, forming these bands, and then they and then and then they stop moving. And these bands that we observe are everywhere in the sample. They span uh, length from the micron to the millimeter scale, and they are stable over time. And what is going on is very obvious if you start looking at what's happening to the motors now this is the same experiment it's likely it's sort of the same experiment but now the motors have two different colors so we can look where they go and what happens is that the motors segregate in space and the microtubule bands that form before are accumulating at the interface so what is going on is that each of these microtubule band is creating um is is uh, creating it's, it's actively pumping motors from from in, in either direction this particular part here is pumping cyan motors on its right and it's pumping magenta motors on its left until they reach a uh, uh, final state in which the the patterns are stable and because uh, the pumping the direction of the pumping has to do with the microtubule polarity. The microtubule at the interface, they all are oriented in the same way. In this particular case, because the microtubule is pumping uh, magenta motors inside here, we know that they all are oriented with their plus tip towards this phase and the minus tip towards the cyan phase. So what you have to imagine is that this state is a bit what I was telling you in the beginning, in which we generated a polarized architecture with with the and this polarized architecture in turn is uh, asymmetrically distributing motors in space. So this is sort of the in vitro analog of uh, of the cytoskeletal network, with the difference that it was uh, self organized from an homogeneous state. And I'm going to show you this image that 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 uh, we did yesterday in which we do the exactly because, I mean, of course, this doesn't really look like a cell because it's an infinite system, but we can do the same thing on a confined space by micro-patterning the bilayer inside this circle, and we get the same thing in which uh, you don't see the other motor as well, but the, the cyan motor, the magenta motors are accumulated in the center, there is a polarized architecture, and there is the uh, cyan motor now accumulated at the edge and of course which of the motor is inside and outside just depends on the relative concentration as we will see in other words we can by this system self-organize a polar architecture and just to make sure let's go uh, through this formation process once more you start with everything in an isotropic state your microtubules are everywhere your motors are everywhere and on average nothing is moving because each microtubule has the same amount of motors but then as soon as you activate your system, the motors will start to accumulate anisotropically in space, depending on the local polarity, which creates a force, a motor imbalance, which creates a force imbalance, which pushes the filaments away. And this process goes on and on and on until you end up in a steady state in which the uh, forces acting on each microtubule are balanced because the concentration of motors at its two sides are balanced. And at the same time, to, to have a steady state, this active pumping due to the microtubules that continuously take motors from one side and push it to the other one has to compensate the diffusion current that, uh, that uh, will bring things back to the steady state. In other words, what you have to imagine is exactly the mental experiment that I, that I described you in the beginning, with the main difference that these Maxwell demons that are separating motors on the two sides receive a feedback from the motors themselves and then organize at the interface between the two faces. Um, and now a bunch of experiments to convince you that everything I've been telling uh, so far is right. So first of all, this is an experiment in which we go at the interface and with a high power laser, we cut the microtubules that are at the interface. And you see that after the cut, the microtubules slide and go again at the interface, meaning that indeed there was force acting on them 
And by cutting, we off balance the force. So the, the microtubules that were under tension shrink and go again at the interface until a new balance is formed. And this is another experiment in which we do the same thing, but now we shine so much laser that we completely kill the microtubules at the interface. So the pumping activity of these microtubules on the right is completely gone. The magenta motors that were outside are able to go in. The cyan motor that were trapped inside are able to go out. And the interface dissolves because the force balance is broken. Also showing how responsive the state is to, to small differences. And you'll see another example very soon. Um, and uh, now we go to modeling. So can we, can we build something that describes uh, this, uh, this system? We went for the easiest possible things. We do the system, we, we, we have a one dimensional system. We imagine that the system already formed bands. Now the bands of course are single microtubules. One is oriented like this. The following one has the opposite orientation because they need to pump motors in the same direction. And the next one again has the opposite one. And we focus, this is the, the motors profile that we expect there to be. So cyan motors at the tip and magenta at the tail and magenta motors at the tip. And we focus on a microtubule in the center. Um, it's relatively easy. There's some algebra involved, but you just imagine that you have a population of motors that can bind to the microtubules and move on it. And then it can detach from the microtubule and diffuse. So basically you have motors diffusing following the diffusive equation but every now and then they can bind to the microtubule and when they bind, they move. And of course, uh, the motors from the bulk can, can attach to the microtubule. And at this moment, we were neglecting all kinds of things. So the motors walk until the end and then they detach. And you can solve these equations. They're not particularly complicated. Um, but the only important thing is that you have the array that that, ma that makes you go from the abound, from the diffusing to the bound population and vice versa. Uh, and you end up with a steady state profiles of motors bound to the microtubule that looks like this. And of course, it's roughly what we see in experiments if we put reasonable parameters. And because the force acting on the filament is a function of uh, of the of the number of bound motors, you end up with an expression for the force acting on the filament. And then the only thing you need to do is imagine you have another population of motor that follows exactly the same rule, except it moves in the opposite direction. So it exerts a force in the opposite direction and you reply and you redo the process and end up with the force exerted by the second population. And you impose that these two forces are the same because at steady state, we expect the microtube will not to move anymore. And this is only possible, of course, under given condition. And if you solve for this, you find a sort of um, um, phase diagram, depending on the relative concentration of the two motors in which, which is pretty clear what's going on. If you have roughly the same amount of motors, you can form patterns. If you exaggerate in either direction, you have gliding. So if you are here, there's too many uh, magenta motors. And if you keep increasing, you end up in the pattern phase. And if you keep increasing at some point, you end up in the gliding phase again. And we run experiments at a lot of different conditions to make sure that indeed it's a bit like this. So the patterns are defined by the relative uh, concentration of the two motors. And it's pretty obvious that you can, with the same, uh, you can start at, at here where you have gliding and redo the experiment just by increasing the cyan motors and the system will go to the, um, will form patterns. So you can sort of move uh, in, in the phase space by changing the concentration of either motors. Uh, we, you can start looking at details like what happens if the two motors are, are slightly different, if one is faster than the other. And you see that the phase diagram it qualitatively looks the same, it just shifts. And this is also why the experimental phase diagram is not perfectly symmetrical because um, the, uh, NCD is much weaker than key 5B. So you need more of it in order to balance the other one. And this is why for 20 nanomolar of one, you don't need 20 of the other, but you need to go to higher concentrations such as 50 or, or 75 or whatever. And 
just to show you how responsive this system is, what we can do is we start our experiment in the gliding phase. And then what we do, we 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 add from the top the, the other motor. So we start with a lot of NCD. And then you will see in this movie in different stages that um, kinesin is added to the sample from the top. You will see there will be a burst of light and the system will transient from the gliding state to the pattern state. And then as we add even more motors, the pattern will dissolve and it will end up in the gliding phase. But the first gliding phase will be an NCD dominant gliding and the second gliding phase will be a kinesin dominant gliding. So you have gliding, you add motors from the top, you get the formation of patterns, you add other motor, you dissolve the patterns and you end up in the opposite gliding phase. You can clearly see the two, glide, the two glidings are different. This is very slow. Then you go to patterns and then you go to very fast gliding because kinesin is faster than in C. So it's a responsive system. If you are a cell, what you can think of is, well, I need my, to, to make my architecture a bit bigger or a bit smaller. And you I to to transit from here to here, you just you just vary the relative amount of motor. And indeed, both theory and experiment confirm that if you keep one motor constant and you increase the concentration of the other one, you you can you're not you're not bound to a simple state as where as when uh, motors were stuck on the glass, where you either had gliding of one kind or gliding of the opposite kind or nothing. Now your the nothing phase has expanded. And it becomes a this patterned phase in which the size of the pattern can be uh, regulated by the relative concentration of motors. And this is both the theory and the experiment sort of agree that you keep uh, NCD constant, you add progressively higher amount of of uh, kinesin, and you see that you transit from uh, sort of 50-50 patterns to much smaller patterns as kinesin wins over NCD until the pattern dissolves and you end up in the gliding phase. Um, this, the next 10 minutes will be, uh, will be devoted to a completely different point of view on this. So this might be a good moment to, to check if in the chat there's somebody screaming, I didn't understand anything. And then answer a couple of questions before, before we go on. Yeah, so there, there are uh, a few interesting questions in the chat. Um, and so the people with questions, um, feel free to unmute. So there's one from Boris uh, Batesman um, about motor directionality. Uh, so I can read your question or feel free to unmute, Boris. Um, I just wanted to understand that um, you don't have a random orientation of motors they don't uh, rotate and they just to the right and to the left so motors are essentially one dimensional right um i mean right and left as defined by the filament polarity so the motors the, what the motors do is when they stick to the filament they know that they have to walk either towards the tip or towards the tail so when they are unbound, they, they can have whatever orientation, but the moment they bind to the filament, they know which way to go. Uh, so if you are in the reference uh, frame of the microtubule, yes, you're right. The one goes left and the other one goes right. But if the if you flip the filament, then the one that was previously going right now goes left and vice versa. So they go towards either the tip or the tail of the filament and that right or left depends on how your filament is oriented. Ah, thank you. So you in, in the one D model that we in the one D model that we discuss, yes, we have decided which one is the left and which one is the right. But in the real experiment, um, depends on where the microtubule is oriented in space. Yeah, so two two D model would be even more fascinating. Uh, let's see if let's see if we if we get there. We will get there. It's coming. Um, so there's also, there's a question from Ashok uh, about um, the MTOC role in um, in vivo. Ashok, do you want to unmute and ask? Or yeah, I can read I think this is probably a better question for the end, but let me ask okay. it anyway. So when one is thinking about, you know, applications of this to the end, the in the cell, isn't there the centrosome or the MTOC, which is a center of microtubule nucleation? 
And so in other words, can't you get, uh, can't you get like symmetry breaking from poly poly polymerization of a polar filament without a Maxwell demon just by polymerization itself? As long yes. as and, and I think and I think uh, you were right. We will get to this uh, in the end. I will try to answer exactly this question. But a bit of a spoiler is yes, in cells, it's it's based on the centrosome and polarization and this polarity. I mean, at the beginning, I told you how is this uh, polar network self-organized. The real answer is that it's not self-organized. It's inherited by the mother cell. So when cells are born, they inherit the polar architecture from their mother. But we will play a trick and uh, and see and see where to go from there. But yes, we will get there. Um, so there are a few more questions. There's one um, from Yi Jiang, which is, it's a short question, so I guess I, I can read it. Uh, she's asking whether the patterns depend on the length of the microtubule fibers. Um, and Yi Jiang, if, if you have um, more detail, feel, feel free to unmute. And ask you know more. Yes, sure. in the beginning the, the... I can already yeah, go, go ahead. On. The the read the answer is yes, but it's mm -hmm. not a, a simple relationship as in uh, uh, the pattern side is the microtubule side. So the length of the microtubule affects a bit the the pattern size, but it's a much more complex. Um, it's a much more complex system. In other words. There isn't a very clear, it, it isn't very clear where the length scale of the pattern is coming from. The microtubule length is part of it, but it's not the fundamental one. And I think I might have something about it. Uh, so let, this is also something we will uh, we will go back uh, shortly. Uh, it, but let's say in the one D model, the length of the microtubule has an effect, but it's it's not as it's not obvious. It's not a clear scaling law such as. Uh, pattern size is uh, length of the microtubule to some power. It's much more convoluted. The general rule is that the pattern size is set by the, the one condition which allows both the diffusive fluxes and the active current to be balanced and a total net force of zero acting on the filaments. This is partially related by the length because the way motors stick and move on the filament depends on the length, but it's not super clear what is the role of the length. And mm -hmm. uh, again, we will have a couple more pointers on this uh, towards the end. Right. Um, I also would like to comment that the gliding fibers really look remarkably similar to the gliding motion of uh, mixobacteria. Yes, and indeed you, you uh, all the, the collective patterns I showed you at the beginning uh, have their analog in mixobacteria and there's a huge, uh, I think a lot of people in the audience uh, worked on this uh, one way or the other, but there's a huge literature on elongated things that move. Uh, and then you can start wondering, uh, I mean, the, these, these are sort of the smallest kind of elongated objects that you can do because they are 10 nanometers in, in diameter, 20 nanometers in diameter, but the collective phases you get indeed depend on the aspect ratio, the speed and the fiber fiber interaction but i mean you're right some of the collective phases uh, gliding assays experiments have have their equivalent in mixobacteria in malaria parasite in uh, self propelled uh, synthetic colloids and so on so it's a huge field of elongated objects that move great thank you so there are a few more questions but i think we should Let's leave those for the end, um, and I guess uh, keep going for now because the others, the other questions may lead to more discussion. And so, yeah, let, well, let's come back to those. Perfect. So this far, I sold you the idea that this was a, a way to reconstitute um, the architecture in general. But I mean, as a physicist, I was looking at this movie, not maybe not this particular one, but movies like this, and I was like this. This reminds me of something. And just to make sure we, we all are on the same page, I'm going to give you a very, very wrong primer on, on phase separation, because what I'm going to end up with is whether this is a phase separating system. Uh, so traditionally, in, in uh, equilibrium thermodynamics, you might think of having two species, again, magenta and cyan, that don't like to be 
uh, together. There is an, in, an energy cost in them being close to each other. And based and and so given the right conditions, they will separate in space to minimize the cost of uh, not being together. And you can draw a very simple phase diagram, which depending on the relative amount of either uh, cyan and magenta and on the temperature, you start with, of course, if you only have one kind, you, you have or, or you or, or if you have a lot of one kind, you will end up with with a coexistence phase, or if you are at very high temperature, this energy cost is irrelevant because the high temperature kills this energy cost. And as you go down with temperature or as your mix approaches a 50-50 ratio, then the fact that these two particles don't like each other starts mattering. And you basically have two main regions, one which is called the metastable region and one which is the unstable region. In the metastable region is where the particles don't like each other, but the energy price they pay for, for not being together is not particularly high. So if they meet, if particles of the same kind meet, they prefer to be with one another rather than to be with the opposite kind. And so locally you get the formation of bubbles. Uh, but overall, the system sort of isn't extremely unhappy in being in the in the coexisting space. Uh, so it, it just forms bubbles locally. And I, I again, for, for the experts in the audience, this is just extremely simplified uh, version of it. But then you have this other region at lower temperatures or at higher uh, packing fractions in which the two particles really don't want to be together. And so all of a sudden, everywhere in your sample, the two particles will separate through this process, which is called spinodal decomposition, in which everywhere they start forming domains and these domains merge and this domain and the merged domains merge again until you end up with complete phase separation of the two particles now when we when you look at these movies it sort of seems like this is what's happening for some reason the two motors separate in space through something that resembles a bit uh, spinodal decomposition and so what we did was can we build a model, which I said now will be 2D, in which we try to model this system, which was born as a biological thing with microtubules and motors, but now it's something more abstract, in which you have four po three populations. You have two population of motors and one population of microtubules, and then you need to add a polarity because the microtubules have their own polarity. And you write a free energy, which is exactly what you will deal, what you will do in the equilibrium system, and the free energy basically says that these two, these three, um, these three components are ideal gases. They don't interact with each other. They they have a, there is a small cost in creating an interface, which is here. The polarity doesn't want to be too high, uh, and and these are all traditional terms that you will put in a in a simple model for, for just an ideal gas. There are these sketchy terms here, which I won't discuss, but they basically, they, they will be important, but we don't, we don't, we ignore them. But the point is this free energy with a small caveat, but this free energy is not a free energy that would lead to phase separation. It's the free energy of free populations that do not talk with each other. So if you mix them, they will go everywhere and don't care about each other. On top of this, we do introduce interaction between these uh, these three fields, but they're not in terms of an energy of the free energy. They're in terms of active currents. So we in, we add to this non-separating free energy the rule that if um, a micro if a motor meets a microtubule, it will move in the direction of the polarity. Uh, there's a plus or minus missing here. It will move either in the direction of the polarity or opposite to the polarity with a given speed. And if a microtubule meets motors, it will react to the motor imbalance and move in either direction, depending on which of the dominant motor is, is winning. Uh, in the opposite direction, then the direction the motor would walk on the microtubule. In other words, just to summarize it, there is three components that do not talk with each other, if not through active currents. They will not do anything to each other. The only thing they do is 
one walk one motors walk on the microtubules and microtubules are pushed by the motors and sure enough if we take this mode with this this system and you end up with the dynamic uh, dynamical equation and you simulate it you end up with something that again looks like spinodal decomposition and again looks like the experiment we see and you end up with phases that remarkably look like what we see in the in the experiments in that the two motors are segregated there is a microtubule interface in the middle and the interface is polarized and there is continuous pumping of the two species of motors across the interface which balances the diffusive fluxes that would um, separate them uh, you can change the relative concentration of the motors and you can end up with sort of these bicontinuous domains, but you can also get a droplet phase. You can show that like in experiment, all of this is something we see in experiments. Uh, you might see this droplet here disappearing, which is exactly what we see sometimes in experiment where we have here you go, disappearing droplets because locally the, the imbalance is too high. You can get small bubbles that remain stable in a sea of bigger domain. You can get domains that merge over time. So we recapitulate most of the experimental observations. And also we recapitulate the fact that as we change the relative density uh, of the motors, uh, we end up with big sausage-like domains. And if one motor is much more dominant than the other, you end up with smaller bubble-like domains. And Again, what we can do is take all the quantities uh, that people would, uh, would use to describe a classical phase separating system and apply them to this biologically inspired one. So for example, here you see the structure factor growing over time that again looks like what you will get for spinodal decomposition with a big difference that might be uh, interesting for people in the audience, which is that this domain if we plot that sort of domain size, don't seem to coarsen. They don't have a, they don't follow the one third scaling law you would expect for for a, for a classical domain, uh, because once you once you get your interface pumping activated, the, the the you don't have a surface tension. We can discuss this a bit more later on, I guess. And again, the the model we drive we we derived uh, sort of looks the same also in in, in these terms we can get a structure factor that look like spinodal decomposition and coarsening of the domains and this all leads to a more general picture which is that now we have a different kind of phase separation a phase separation which is not based on the two particles not liking each other because the two particles per se will not interact if not for the presence of an entity, the microtubule, which is pushing them on either side. So in instead of temperature, uh, you end up with activity, your phase diagram flips, uh, and you end up again with a coexistence phase, which will be where one of the motor is winning and the filaments just move everywhere. A sort of metastable phase in which you get droplets and a sort of uh, unstable phase where you get spinodal decomposition-like behavior. So the idea is whether we can take all the classical quantities and map them on their non-equilibrium counterparts. And um, hopefully this proves that, uh, that at least in some cases, self-organization can lead to, to interesting results. Uh, but I, I and, and patterns of this kind have been observed in in other biologically relevant system, and uh, such as this um, this uh, Chang and Ferrell paper I described you at the beginning, where you get the formation of these compartments, and you if you look where the motors are, they are a bit where you would expect following the logic that I described you before. There's another paper by Mitchinson where they showed that in some condition, again, frog uh, extracts assemble into this, what they call pineapple-like uh, patterns, which are microtubules, polarity sorted with the two different motors at either, at either sides. So it is possible that a uh, transport-based active phase separation system is indeed at play in biological systems. However, we go back to the questions we were discussing before. Uh, this is definitely not true for, for normal cells. Uh, 
that inherit their, their architecture, their, their radial architecture from the mother. But we wondered whether on whether yes, the cell maybe inherits the architecture from the mother, but a process of this kind might be still acting uh, in the background to guarantee stability. And we started wondering how can we reveal this? So what, what I'm going to show you is an experiment that we still don't understand fully, in which you take a cell, which has an, would have a radial architecture, you completely depolymerize the radial architecture. So you sort of create a bag of protein kind of thing. And then you uh, make it regrow, but with a, an additional drug that, that, that doesn't allow the microtubules to grow. So you end up with short microtubules everywhere that are not able to grow and reform the radial architecture they would have natively. And this is what happens. Instead of doing what they should do, the microtubule assembles into these things, into these sort of bands. And if we look a bit closer, they look similar to what uh, we observe in experiments. So we have microtubules that are polarity sorted and are assembled in, in sort of bands. So the idea is that cells have several ways to organize their polarity and their, and their cytoskeleton architecture and a process conceptually similar to what I have discussed so far might be uh, running in the background of the cell and can be revealed if you remove all the processes that are on top of it. And, and again, it does, it's probably not going to be two different kinesins walking, uh, uh, diffusing on a membrane. But it's a more general idea that because the microtubule is polar, they ca it can sort things at its end, and, and also it can it, maybe also growing can play a, can play the role of an active flux. So what I mean is that while we did do the experiments with motors working on the filament, the same logic might apply to any Maxwell demon-like process that might be happening inside the cell um, to shape its architecture. And with this, I think you've had enough of, uh, of me talking. So thanks again for, for staying and listening. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. And just to summarize, uh, we started with a reconstituted system, which showed us a novel kind of uh, active phase separation. There are similar examples in the literature already, to be uh, perfectly honest. And maybe concepts of this kind that seems very abstract when you first uh, meet them might actually mutatis mutandis uh, play a role in uh, in real sets. And thank you for for listening.